the term engineer, and especially with Cope 2 being a full stack engineer, it doesn't feel real. That's kind of calling yourself a CEO of your Etsy shop. How curious are you with the follow-up of being how tenacious are you? I abide by the belief that anyone can be an engineer, but if you do not have the drive, you probably shouldn't be an engineer. In today's episode, we have Jose Delgado, who is an alumni of Code Platoon, a coding bootcamp for veterans and currently a software engineer. Welcome, Jose. Good to be here. Thank you for having me, Felix. So you um, have interesting uh, journey to get here. You served in U.S. Navy as a cryptologic warfare officer before com- becoming a software engineer. First of all, first time I've heard of that that particular role. I guess I'm not well versed in the different kinds of job functions in the U.S. Navy, but it sounds like a very interesting role. So I'd love to hear more about what which experience was like in the Navy. Yeah, it was fun. So actually, when I first commissioned back in 2017, I was a nuclear engineer and failed out. Could not do nuclear physics, save my life. But I looked through the package or the redesignation package and the option for cryptologic warfare officer existed. Didn't know what that was either. They never talked about it in any of like the Navy courses. Come to find out, it's basically the execution of intelligence, signals intelligence, and special missions ashore and afloat. So I got to meet some really cool people, do some really cool missions. Can't go into detail about any of them, unfortunately, but it was generally just enjoyable. It really helped me kind of see a lot of big picture concepts from the ground and understand how every little cog played into the overall machine, if that makes sense. So you already had some of this experience already in a tech-related role, and you had a degree in computer science before deciding to go down a route of going to a boot camp. Why not just go straight to get a job as a, as a software engineer? So because I, I was on an NROTC scholarship through the Citadel, so I wasn't actually allowed to take up a civilian job until five years after of obligated mandatory military service, just based on the scholarship itself. So even though I knew probably a little bit towards the end of my, my tenure at, the, at college, uh, I knew that I wanted to do engineering. I wasn't able to, just out of obligation. When the five years was up, though, I was able to actually put in package and it just didn't seem like a smart idea to go from having no tech experience to now being in the real world out of the military with no tech experience. So thankfully, the person I replaced on my ship, he actually went through Copatoon as well. I don't remember his cohort, but he told me about the skill bridge. He was like, hey, when you get to your one year mark and you're about to get out, remember that skill bridge exists and apply for it. And sure enough, while I was on, in the middle deployment, went ahead, did it, went through it all. And Copatoon picked me up, carried me forward. So. Yeah, Global Tune is, a, is pretty is unique. Is it? it's a more of a specialized coding bootcamp. A lot of the ones that are out there, anyone can apply for. It. This one specifically is geared towards helping veterans and and their spouses. Can you tell us more about Global Tune and like how it all works? Yeah, so Global Tune, it, it felt like almost like a job interview because you don't just apply, get in, you're happy. You have to apply, kind of go through a couple interviews, and I had to run through coding problems, submit a YouTube video explaining how my thought process as I went through that problem. Any prospective Copatoon students, you'll end up going through that. You'll end up doing it, getting submitted. You'll get a response, hopefully saying, congratulations, you're accepted into whatever cohort. And then you have the option, and that's what I loved about Copatoon, to actually devote an extra 30 days to a program called the Fundamental Programming. So especially for those who are coming in and have zero technical experience, this is specifically designed to introduce you to the basic tenets of computer science and engineering software development so that you don't come in blind and hit a wall. So that you're kind of, it's, it's difficult. It's a couple hours at the end of uh, your workday, but it, it, it was fantastic. So the bootcamp, it was five months long for you. And after mm-hmm. your bootcamp, you got a job as a, an associate software engineer, like very quickly, like a month after that, which is, I think, pretty quick compared to others that, are, that have gone through boot bootcamp. Like, tell us about your job search experience. Yeah, so it'd be a little unfair to just say, like, buff up and say, yeah, it was only a month and I got a job. I actually started my LinkedIn and job search seriously about a month before graduation, which that's your personal project and group project time. So at that point in Copatoon, time's basically all yours. You have a product that you need to deliver. You're the one who puts the ideas and stuff. And so I took out usually about an hour during the day to spruce up my LinkedIn, shoot out resumes. And that's what I did for almost two months straight like actually talking. Fortunately, LinkedIn was great to use. And I guess it helped me get boosted because it wasn't actually even a job I applied for. It, someone had found me and they're from my current company is the VP of cloud engineering. He just goes, hey, uh, I've seen your LinkedIn. I like what you have. Do you have a resume you mind shooting over? 
And I responded, I don't know you. I don't trust you. Can you prove to me who you are? <laughs> and that just kind of started everything. And we kept talking and the company was great enough to accommodate me being, seeing family graduate as, as my sister graduates, stuff like that. So all my interviews were over the internet, just like a Zoom interview. And I got to meet my FDM and my VP. And then my final in-person interview was at my current location. It got hired shortly after. So yeah, it, it was pretty quick, but it was it was still a little bit of a grind on it. Yeah, no, I hear that the prep work is, is still work. And even though you got a job a month after graduating, you still mm -hmm. had to do a lot of preparation leading up to that. But I'd love to hear more about your strategy with LinkedIn. I think it's sometimes underutilized by people that are looking for a job where they might use LinkedIn just to kind of apply with a bunch of places, but it sounds like you do a little bit more uh, on LinkedIn than others may have done. Like what, what kind of suggestions do you have about how people can use LinkedIn better to land a software engineering job? So I don't remember if it was because military or co-platoon, but I was, we were able to get a year of LinkedIn premium just during the coding bootcamp. As a result of that, I was able to use, LinkedIn has a feature where you use hashtag open for, open for work, hashtag open for work. And so it has like a little green circle around your profile uh, picture, and it makes you a uh, higher priority search for any recruiters or agencies that are looking for uh, a person with these this criteria. Maybe you have a clearance, maybe you have experience, maybe you have no experience, but you have a couple projects under your belt through Copatoon or whatever bootcamp you end up choosing. I believe that was the game changer that actually made me appear on people's radars because I, I started seeing DMs and messages coming in like immediately after getting that open. But also just having a robust profile. Don't just have the bare bones stuff. Like do projects and do things on the side that you can speak to. During my final technical interview, in fact, I was already known in the office because the project I did was a RuneScape led project. And I'm an, I'm a nerd when it comes to video games. So RuneScape's been my baby for since February. And it got the interest of, of the hiring personnel as well as my VP, who I did the final interview with. So don't don't just try to be a puzzle piece. I, th I like that you emphasize the uh, projects for people out there that are building their portfolio that may be going through boot camp or self-studying. How do you choose projects that you think will look good, that will be attractive to like people that are hiring? So the first thing I look at is what am I interested in? If you choose a project that maybe it implements all of the React framework and you know that everything's going to slide in nicely and animate beautifully and all the color go will probably come together really well, but you hate it, you're not going to want to work on it. And that's actually going to show through the quality of your work and through how much detail you put in. You're not going to want to look as close and clean out as many bugs if it's something you don't want to deal with. So the first thing is find something you're interested in. And the second thing would be find a common problem. If you go to the coffee shop constantly, you get annoyed by lines. It may not have to be like an actually person tracker, but create an application that, I don't know, pulls from Google Maps API, shows the coffee areas and their peak hours and recommends a good coffee shop. Like something that you're interested in and that could solve a problem. Both of those are massive wickets for companies hiring. Once you got that initial job offer for that company that you're now working at, how did that feel? Like, what was that experience like when you got the offer to now be like a software engineer working in the industry? First thing I did was pop a bottle of champagne. I was expecting about a four month grind and it stopped in about two. So was definitely pleased, but it was also just kind of a, a weird little rush of adrenaline because... The term engineer, and especially with Coke 2 being a full stack engineer, it doesn't feel real. It feels like you're kind of giving yourself a title and it's kind of calling yourself a CEO of your Etsy shop. You technically are, but you're not, and you don't know how to deal with it. But the moment you get a job offer saying you're an associate engineer, that's, that's you. And it kind of sets in place, hey, everything I learned, everything I talked about, everything that I said I can do, I need to make sure I can actually execute in a real world environment. This is actually going to affect companies, baselines, like enterprises, what you, what you do is going to impact. And it's kind of a surreal moment. Yeah. And speaking of like actually stepping into the shoes and being a software engineer, did that, did that job like meet your expectations of what you expected it would be like to be a software engineer? Was it stressful? Like tell us about what that getting, what, what actually like working that first job was like, especially in the early days. I don't know what I expected, honestly, uh, especially with the military. When you get a new job, your turnover is about a week and then they're gone and you're expected to know. Every meeting that's about to happen, every system that's under your control, all the maintenance schedules, and there's a lot to learn. But when I stepped into the job with my company, they already had a 30, 60, 90 day uh, ramp up period. And their first job, the first thing they want me to do, of course, two weeks is, hey, we want you to show up to work. We want you, here's two certifications you're going to need for the contract you're going to do. But before that, we want you to kind of 
explore the facilities, talk to people, get to know your coworkers. And so it was a good first week where I was getting paid on their overhead to just kind of exist and look and ask people what they did. They wanted me to know. Since my company is relatively small, they offer, even though I'm an associate engineer, I sit in the domains of software engineering, systems engineering, and cloud administration. And they made it known from the beginning that I had the freedom to bounce back and forth, but they basically said, choose your own adventure on this one. I don't know how many, many companies are like that, but there was definitely a massive boost to my enjoyment from work because now I don't have to stare at a screen all day. I can worry, I can start programming on one project, move over to another. And as long as my time codes are right and I'm making pro incremental progress, I've never been yelled at, never been told this is crap. If I put out a, if I do something incorrect, my leadership or my, excuse me, my engineering manager, he'll be honest, but it's like, yeah, you probably shouldn't do this. And here's why and he'll explain. And so it's been nothing but learning. And I love that. Never once been torn down. Always just been great. Yeah. It almost sounds like you have now just more time to, to really absorb in and transition to the role. Like you mentioned mm -hmm. before, when there's a turnover in the Navy, you had a week to figure everything out, which is crazy. <laughs> Could imagine yep. onboarding to anything in a week. For anyone out there that wants to follow this path, can you to share maybe some of the maybe challenges with the transition between uh, your time in the Navy and into more of like a, I guess a civilian role as like an associate engineer? Like, was there, it sounds like all great things so far you described, but were, were there anything that was challenging about this transition? Yeah, especially for the veterans out there that have been put, been working your eight to fours that are actually 24 hour watches and all these last minute things. It's going to be really difficult to calm down, if that makes sense. The hardest part that is still an ongoing struggle is managing performance anxiety. In the military, it's a lot of you do it right the first time. And if anything's messed up, you're in the sauce at that point. You're just in trouble, especially in the civilian sector. Your job is only eight to four. Your company may allow overtime. Mine does not. When I do my eight hours for the day, I'm done at the end of that eight hour period. And it's a really unsettling feeling going from you're technically always on call to go home and relax because you just can't relax. I know my husband was prior army. It took him about a year and a half to settle in from army infantry standards of movement and watch and guard and all that jazz down to, all right, now you're a civilian. Bye-bye. So when you got this job, you actually ended up taking a, a pay cut when you transitioned from the military to a civilian job. Can you share more about the decisions behind that? Because I think it's an important one where you might take a, a step in, someone out there might want to take a step in a certain direction, but it is a pay cut, but maybe they see a future in it. Tell us about your decision making process here. Right. So for a little cut more context, because that is actually important. I was a lieutenant in the Navy. So I was an 03 with six years of experience. So 03 over six, it was making, it was, it was making a good amount of money. So it was kind of expected to be taking a pay cut in the civilian world, uh, mostly because a lot of your military pay, and this is for officers and enlisted, is non-taxable BAH or BAS, right? So it's allowance for housing, allowance for subsistence. So that's like food and rent and stuff like that. And again, non-taxable, you don't claim it on your income, any of that. So losing that portion was a major financial hit, but the quality of life, that has since followed made the adjustment worth it. Yeah, that, that makes sense because I think a lot of people might consider changing jobs, whether they are tr tr transitioning from another industry, from non-tech into tech or changing jobs with, from within tech where they are going to take a pay cut, but they're doing it because they see that maybe there's growth potential in the future or for the quality of life. I think quality of life, like the work-life balance, I think is, is becoming much more important these days. Would you be able to share what the income is? What can some people expect if they are coming in as a good associate or junior engineer? So again, it depends on the package you get. So Glassdoor, again, was 68 to 90K for an associate level engineer with zero experience. I am currently sitting on the higher end because I was able to push my military experience as well as my previous development experience in. But because I had no industry experience, they still wanted me to kind of have a ramp up period, uh, which was understandable. But at the same time, they also offer company covered health care. And it's like a $5,200 a year education stipend. So certification, stuff like that is covered by, uh, by it. Those are kind of considerations to also think about whenever you're negotiating income and, look, and adding up your income. Yeah, I'm taking a pay cut, but I'm still not even paying for my uh, health insurance. And it's through a good health insurance group. Mm. So you, you mentioned earlier that you would have no qualms about endorsing someone going to a boot camp like uh, Code, Pl Code Platoon. But for someone that is... Not sure if they want to be a software engineer, but they think they might be interested in, they might have heard from you about 
what the job is like. They see what your work life balance is like now. They, they're interested in it. How would you help them uncover or what kind of questions would you ask them or how would you help them figure out if it would be a good fit for them or not? The first thing I'd ask is how curious are you with the follow-up of being how tenacious are you? I abide by the belief that anyone can be an engineer, right? Especially with the modern internet era, YouTube, you got Code Academy, you got everything to teach you how to code and the principles of computer science. Anyone can be an engineer, but if you do not have the drive if you look at something and say, this is too difficult, I don't know if I can do it, and then stop, like that doubt's fine, but full on quitting, you probably shouldn't go through a coding bootcamp. You probably shouldn't be an engineer because those are both the biggest tenants. You're not being hired because you know every single coding language of the world. You're being hired because you can learn and what you don't know, you will take it upon yourself to investigate. Those are massive in any kind of engineer. You know, given that, that experience that you've had, early on with this first job, what do you feel like is an important skill set that, that you have or that you feel like you want to work on more that you think will help you grow the most as a software engineer? Let's see, most important skill set would probably be auxiliary tools, if that makes sense, and using them. So GitHub, GitHub Desktop, and Git in general, Subversion, all those are repository and project management tools. Just kind of understanding how they can play into coding environments would have been a little better. IDEs and independent development environments as well, because would have also been useful because Coptoon will focus a lot on, you'll have like your initial hit on an install fest where you get your development environment set up through VS code and all that jazz. But since that's the one thing I had exposure to, it was a little weird switching over to Eclipse for Java. So two language, a language I hadn't touched in a while, an ID I hadn't touched in a while, while using GitHub desktop, which I had never used. I've only used Git and GitHub through the CLI. I just kind of wish I had been more curious and looked through a couple of those industry standard supporting tools while yeah. I hoped in. So speaking of tools, you use any uh, like specific like uh, AI related tools for your day to day job, like GitHub Copilot or ChatGPT or anything that to help you augment uh, your your work? Yeah, actually, ChatGPT is phenomenal. I remember when it started out, people were like, "Oh, it's going to replace engineers and stuff like that." And awesome, that's about saying the oven's going to replace the baker. ChatGPT, I believe, is probably one of the most important tools you can learn because it progresses your methodologies of finding something that you don't currently know about, if that makes sense. You don't know what you don't know until you know is something that I learned early on in the military, and that kind of leads into asking questions. And especially with engineering, since you're using so many tools, and there's so many different ways to implement methods and functions and classes, depending on what programming language you're using. But also at the same time, I'd like a little caution of don't use AI as a crutch. And you can tell a developer who uses it as a tool versus a crutch because if you don't understand why something works or why something doesn't work, and ChatGPT does, you need to start researching it. If you can't answer that question, you're using it as a crutch. What about, do you have any like hot takes about that with the software engineer career or maybe like a popular opinion that you just don't agree with? I already said the whole AI is going to make it, make being an engineer non-existent. And I already gave the analysis or the analogy of the oven to the baker. You can easily weed out an engineer who's done nothing but chat GPT or co their way through things. I personally, in my hot take, I don't think you should have AI in integrated into IDEs. Even Eclipse IDE, where it does its little autofill, annoys the hell out of me. The way I see it, as you are typing your code, you should be thinking of what you're doing at that time and not what's going to be predicted. I think in AI code analysis to review to make sure nothing's done and to give recommendations on, hey, this could be improved by, I think that's fantastic. Because again, especially with engineering, there are so many ways to, imp to create a single pop-up window. One of them is going to be fast, lightweight, intuitive, and the other one's going to brick your machine and you're going to have to buy a whole new one, as well as the other one million in between. But if you can't conceptualize your language, like Java is object-oriented, so everything's thought as being an object and being classful, which means... If you want your print statement, instead of using system out print line, if you want to create, I don't know, a print like in Python, how would you think about that? If you can't think about it without AI or GPT filling it in for you, then you've made a huge error. You're going to, I feel like, again, that's going to start weeding out the developers that use GPT as that crutch more and more. That always the first move is to download GitHub Copilot or now, God forbid, maybe GitHub disappears and goes bankrupt overnight. Congratulations. Now you have, you've been relying on AI for so long and you've been auto, like you, you, you've been doing the, uh, the, uh, hotkeys to autofill your lines that you don't remember system out print. What's the next part of my, of, of the code? I can't remember. I usually tab through S Y S and it just auto completes it.
And that's, uh, yeah, that, I just don't like AI integrating to I, IDEs from a pre, uh, programmable, from a programming mm -hmm. sense. I like that. That That is a yeah. hot take. I think that's, I think <laughs> I, I hear your point though about how it makes it too easy to be, to have it as a crutch. And I, I think, you know, yeah. before ChatGPT was around, Stack Overflow copy and paste was the thing where people just kind of like looked up their problem and someone might have put up a code snippet somewhere oh and just God. copy and paste it into their code without not yep. understanding how it all works. So yeah, the, if you are you know, taking the kind of the lazy shortcut way, I think you'll always fall behind and kind of not be exposed, but you'll, you won't make it as far in the industry. So thank you so much for your time. Jose Delgado, a current software engineer and an alumni of Code Platoon, which is a coding bootcamp for veterans. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your journey, advice, and experience with us. Thanks for having me, Felix. It's been a ton of fun.